Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got an early impression video on a house that has never been discussed on my channel yet. As far as having an individual video and review dedicated to this house before, I actually own zero bottles from this house. So really the only way I'm able to get to know these fragrances like this is from the generosity of the community. And this decant comes very kindly from my good friend Nick, who has been uh, a savior as far as allowing my nose to sniff new fragrances I never would be able to get my nose on otherwise. So thank you for your generosity, Nick. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And it's because of you that I'm able to do these type of videos. So again, thank you very much, sire. So uh, today we're going to talk about the house of Filippo Sorsinelli, uh, an Italian born in 1975 in central Italy. And um, this house, actually, I have smelled another one of the fragrances from this house before, and I was really blown away. It was called But Not Today. And apparently But Not Today is focused around uh, Hannibal, and um, I, it was a really good fragrance. I really enjoyed it. It's on my blind, it's, it's on one of my blind sniffing episodes. If you go to my live streams and go through my blind sniffing episodes, you'll be able to find the video where I talked about But Not Today really like uh, what I smelled there, and I know my brother across the pond, my brother from another mother, Rich Mitch, he um, really likes Lauves. Uh, and basically what happened is uh, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Sorsinelli, created his um, brand. He basically founded his brand of, um, uh, I guess you could call it, you know, his uh, his fashion house, if you will, in 2001, and the name of his fashion house was Lauves, okay? So that was the name of um, of also the incense perfume that I know Rich Mitch really likes, and then he created his fragrance label, and the fragrance label in, in 2013, 2014 time frame, he ended up creating his fragrance label called Unum, and so whenever you look at a lot of his fragrances, you'll see Unum Lauves, or for example, you'll see Unum um, Enu Noir, or Unum uh, Opus 114, which is what we're dealing with today. Unum Opus 114. So I guess it can get a little bit confusing, uh, but many of his perfumes have Unum first because that's basically the name of his fragrance label, if you will. So let me read you a little bit about the man, the house. We'll talk about this fragrance, and this is just an early impression. It's not like I've worn a whole bottle of this, but I'm going to give you my thoughts enough to where, you know, I've worn this as my scent of the day today. I've got about an eight-hour dry down here, and I have a fresh spray about an hour ago here. It really is nice. Um, so so here's the background on the house. So the house of Filippo Scorsinelli. It says the artistic genius Filippo Scorsinelli. Uh, Sorsinelli is exceptional because he does not fit just into one category, but it's this multi-talented personality that makes his background so interesting. Again, born in 75 in central Italy, his passion was music, which is why he was already a sought-after church organist at the age of 13. Sorsinelli also did his training in sacred music. Over the next few years, he expanded his artistic creative horizons to include graphic design, fashion, photography, painting, and architecture. As a religious Italian, Filippo Sorsinelli had a particularly close bond with his church. That's why he, relati he, quick he relatively quickly received his first orders from the Vatican for his fashion studio, which opened in 2001 and was named Praise Him, H-Y-M-N, Praise Him. Uh, for example, the studio made exclusive religious vestments for Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI. So I was reading that he actually made robes for Pope Francis in 2013 and numerous robes for Pope Benedict in 2016, which is kind of a cool honor. And so fabrics, gowns, caps, and major international museums also uh, often come from Sorsinelli's studio. Very cool. Very cool stuff there. And then this unique honor was not enough for Sorsinelli. He sought often creative challenges in 2013 to enhance the eclectical dresses the fragrance label Unum was born. And Sorsinelli combined several fine perfume flavors with the scent of rose and incense to wet the religious vestments with them, bringing them even closer to his religious meaning. The multi-artist likes to call his company olfactory tailoring. Okay, so anyways, that's a little bit of background on the on this brand. And see, the thing about the modern perfume world is even for someone like me who 
takes this pretty seriously and constantly tries to sort of chip away and put content on my YouTube channel for you guys to sort of see where I stand on a fragrance. You know, I want it to be like a uh, Encyclopedia Britannica of fragrances. The problem is there's just a million of them. It's impossible to keep up. So if it weren't for people like Nick sending me very generous decants like this where I can wear and get to know, very, very hard to just keep up without, you know, spending lots of your own money. Um, and so one of the things that I have noticed, though, is that I am focusing a lot of work on these decants, which, you know, are, are fragrances that haven't caught my attention enough to buy, or some of them I just didn't know about. You know, it's impossible. You, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so a lot of this is exploration for me, getting to know something and stuff like that. But I'm going to do a separate, I'm going to, I'm going to do a separate, um, category of, of fragrance videos very soon called the all-time greats is what I'm going to call it, where I'm going to dive into my all-time favorites and review them. So the Hugo Boss number ones, you know, the Antaeuses, the Coros, those are going to be the all-time great reviews. And I think, um, you know, that, that'll be a good offset to, to some of the exploration that I've been doing. But um, this is a house that definitely deserves exploring for someone who likes fragrances because this is a high quality, as far as the ingredients go, this house has a couple things going for it. Number one, it's extremely high quality ingredients from what I smell, uh, from what I've smelled from the two fragrances from the house I've smelled so far. And the other thing is they're extremely artistic and they're not following trends. It doesn't feel like they're following trends. It really feels like they're just doing whatever they want. And if people like it, great. And if they don't, great too. They don't really care. And I like that type of perfume. Just sort of, you know, do whatever we want. We go our own way. We blaze our own path, that kind of thing. And that's what it feels like this Filippo Sorsinelli house is doing. So let's read a little bit about Opus 114. So first of all, the name. The name can be a little bit strange to somebody uh, if you're not familiar with um, the reference. But the 11, the 1144 uh, is reference to a year. And it's supposed to celebrate the birth of Gothic, of the Gothic Renaissance, if you will. In France, that's spread all over Europe. And so diversifying and adapting itself according to customs and traditions. And the term was used at first by Giorgio Vasari to point to the Nordic, barbaric, and capricious elements of Gothic. Unum wants to consecrate it as a renaissance, adding meanings and symbols to the olfactory range and making Opus 1144 unique and unrepeatable. From the bottom emerge white musks and gray amber. So this is a musky fragrance. That's the very first thing that you must know. Um, many of the fragrances that popped in my head, the very first wear that I gave this were musk fragrances, but there is more to it, of course. And a light, lively, and warm element rich in pheromones. Talking about the gray amber, which is basically another word for ambergris. It comes from Indian Ocean, from the Indian Ocean. It is a very rare amber capable to fix the other olfactory pyramid components. And ambergris really does work as a beautiful fixative on the skin. And this is a pretty long lasting fragrance. Although it doesn't feel like it's a huge projector or anything like that. I actually wore it in, it's July in Texas right now. So it's hundred degrees out there. And I had absolutely no problem wearing this. Uh, it's gray color is connected to the laden sky of Normandy, the place where Gothic has roots. At the base, leather notes, vanilla, sandal, and Indian wood that is a that is a spirits harmony harmonies generator talk together and facilitate our openness to spiritual growth indian wood leads us to benzoin and tears from sumatra indochina whose thick whitish resins is used almost like an inebriating sweet balsam for the heart notes opus 1144 talks to the gothic atmosphere of the cashmere woods and its bright smooth nature tied to the malts iris and orchid symphony at the top, we find Elemy, a very rare resin whose silhouette stands against the Norman-laden sky and settle there with Jasmine in order to dissipate any fears. Okay, so that is sort of just a quick rundown on the fragrance. So the background is supposed to be the um, Gothic celebrate, the Gothic Renaissance in, in France in the year 1144. And so the fragrance, basically, when you first spray this, you're going to notice a couple things. So the first thing you're going to notice is that it opens up with a huge blast of powdery orange, okay? And um, the powdery orange, I've heard some people refer to it as like this creamsicle. It's not really a creamsicle to me uh, because creamsicles can give you this almost refreshing, you know, feel in like the summer heat. Imagine having like a orange creamsicle slush or something. It doesn't feel like that. It really feels more like a heady 
jasmine opening. Imagine um, that you're standing next to a jasmine bush, right? And you're smelling the fresh jasmine flowers, and there's something a little dirty in the jasmine that you're smelling, but it's blending with this orchid, and this very powdery, creamy orange is really what it feels like. It's like a creamy, powdery orange that you first smell. And underneath, even when you first spray, underneath there is something that almost feels like it's lurking in the background. And that animalic lurking background feel doesn't feel like castorium or civet to my nose, although... To be fair, I think there actually is a castorium note listed in here. To me, um, I get more of this um, musk. So they list white musk, which is sort of a synthetic type of musk, which is what you expect. No one's going to use real musk in a fragrance like this. By the way, 100 mils is $210 on Lucky Scent, just FYI. So the prices are relatively fair for this type of fragrance. I know $210 is a lot of money nowadays. Uh, but it is a 100 mil bottle and um, the, the you know, level of perfume you're getting for it, that, that seems like a fair price. They could definitely ask more, let's put it that way, especially with the way niche pricing is going nowadays. Um, so, so um, basically the fragrance as it continues to sort of sit on your skin, you get this fresh incense type of feel from the Elemi. The Elemi is right there from the top. And you get this sort of fresh Elemi, which um, adds this 3D type of effect to the creation. So uh, they're, they're on one website, so on Lucky Scent, it actually does list bergamot in the top. But on Parfumo and, uh, or on Parfumo, there is no bergamot note listed. I will say that um, I think there probably is some bergamot in the opening of this. Although the main citrus that you're going to get is that mandarin orange, hands down. Mandarin orange with that Elemi, with the jasmine, is sort of the, the opening. And I think the Elemi adds this slightly lemony, um, this slightly lemony-like uh, vibe to the fragrance, if you will. So, um, you basically get this, uh, this, this lemony, incense -y twist in the opening, if you will, with that powdery orange. And, um, and, and Filippo Sorsonelli basically said that music is a big motivator to him. He, he, this is a quote. He basically says that the organ is part of me even when it is silent. So it's, that's, that's a direct quote from him. It's actually a pretty cool quote. And the notes of this fragrance, um, as a fragrance lover, what's interesting, if you really think about the organ notes being played, right? You think about the, the organ notes being played by someone who is trained and practiced playing the organ their whole life and how beautiful the music sounds as it's being played. You know, just imagine each one of those notes being highlighted in this fragrance as if someone is playing it on an organ because you can really feel this, um, you know, the notes have this power behind them in their fragrance, in this fragrance. It really does. It has this uh, powerful um, stroke-like feel to the, to the perfumes. And so, so one rumor about this fragrance that I have to address, and I'll just read you the little blurb from, from Lucky Scent. So it says, all the drama of a diva, all the radiance of a legend, Opus 1144 comes bedecked with the glittering sparkle of citrusy gems atop an opulent Shalimar style sparkle of citrusy, uh, so, sorry, Shalimar style ball gown of sumptuous vanilla and heady jasmine. So, um, Shalimar is, is listed right there on the Lucky Scent description, and if you go to sites like Parfumo, the very first thing that pops up as similar is Shalimar. That's, that's what people compare this to. They compare it to Shalimar. And it's interesting because the, when I like to sort of wear the fragrance and make my own assumptions before I read what other people are saying, and so the Shalimar thing really came to me after I saw other comparisons to it. And then it started to make sense to me somewhat, although it's not the first thing that came in my mind. Um, to me, the other thing I should mention is that Shalimar is superior in every way. Like uh, I would wear Shalimar, uh, this is a, I think an 80s EDT. I'm not 100% sure, uh, but I would wear Shalimar 10 times out of 10 over, over, Unum Opus 1144. Just, just my opinion, but I, I love Shalimar. I think it's one of the greatest fragrances ever created. This can't touch Shalimar to me. Um, the comparison is almost not fair. You know, it's like comparing it to a, I don't know, it's like comparing a modern baseball player to Babe Ruth or something or, or 
um, you know, Mickey Mantle or whoever, whoever you want to compare it to, like comparing a modern musician to Mozart or something, you know, it's just not a fair comparison to me. Um, and so to me, there's no comparison. Shalimar is superior in every way. And, um, when I tried to think of fragrances before I, I heard about the Shalimar comparison, uh, musky, heavy, heavier scent profiles came to mind first. So imagine something like this. Imagine something like Muscoublai Khan. Imagine something, imagine a, a musk heavy creation like Claire de Musk. Imagine something like uh, Carnicure, uh, like Marlowe's Carnicure. And imagine, this is the one I think that really comes the closest to me. Imagine something like this, Musk Ravageur. So imagine a modern niche take on um, on a musk heavy composition like Musk Ravageur, uh, but with the musks even more turned up, if that makes sense. So the vintage bottle of Musk Ravageur does have a little bit more of those animalic musks in here. It has a little bit more of the dirtiness. The newer bottle has more of this sort of gourmand, um, almost like a Cinnabon, if you will. If you ever walk past a Cinnabon store in the airport or something or, or a mall, uh, and it has that sweet, cinnamony, gourmand-like feel. Um, that's what the modern Musk Ravageur bottles smell like. And so if you if you took something like Musk Kublai Khan, sort of the dirty musks is really what I'm getting at. Because to me, um, Opus 114 is a musk-heavy composition first, before it's an amber composition, if that makes sense. So uh, while there is that bergamot touch in the opening... It's nothing like the huge bergamot blast in Shalimar. It's just, uh, it's it's nowhere near. I think the bergamot is something like 30% of the composition of Shalimar. And uh, the bergamot blast in Shalimar is just, the opening is far superior on Shalimar to me. There's something a little strange and dirty, like I said, lurking underneath in um, Opus 1144, which I usually like animalic dirtiness. It may come from a blend of the musks and the ambergris. Um, and, but the powderiness, I think, is really what's reminding, that powdery, vanillic, ambery feel is what, rem is what reminding people of Shalimar. And so, you could imagine something like maybe a cross or a blend between Shalimar and Musk Ravageur. Imagine just blending these two together with some balsamic, um, modern materials, right? So, Imagine um, these modern materials in Opus 114 that just weren't there when Shalimar was initially created. So, you know, imagine a, um, imagine a sort of cashmere, this sort of cashmere wood, irisy, benzoiny, modern sort of uh, niche fragrance that takes little bits and pieces from some of the musk-heavy compositions I mentioned and something like Shalimar maybe the ambery vanillic of, uh, bits of Shalimar, and blends them together. And that's really probably as close as I can get to a comparison for uh, Opus 1144. And as the hours tick by, one thing I will mention is that as the hours tick by, sort of the, um, the amber vanillic side of Shalimar starts to come out a little bit more in Opus 114. So the comparison doesn't seem as crazy. When you first smell, I don't think there's any comparison at all. I never would think about Shalimar originally, but as the hours tick by, it does start to make a little bit more sense. And, you know, my biggest issue, again, is I, I think Opus 114 is a good fragrance. I just think that if I wanted to wear this style, for me personally anyways, I would just reach for Shalimar every single time. Or Musk Ravageur or something like that, or even Musk Kublai Khan, or, you know, there's so many fragrances in this style um, that I think I would pick over wanting to buy a bottle of Opus 1144 at this point in my journey. And so if you like these modern sort of, um, you know, cashmere, cashmeran type of notes in a perfume, if you like this modern niche style fragrance, I think you should definitely give this a sniff. Um, you know, imagine that Musk Ravageur with the musk amped up even further. And as the fragrance continues to dry, one thing you'll notice is this sort of cinnamon heavy, uh, powdered, almost like this powdery honey. Imagine having a, a powdery honey smelling uh, composition 
where, um, you know, the, the floral, fruity, sweet side of the orchid comes out and slowly gives way to something that turns into this incense -y like leather. And so the dry down is where, so like I said, this is an eight hour dry down. And to me, the dry down um, is you're going to bring in much more of the leather, this incense-y leather starts to come through. Whereas here, an hour in, it's still feeling like you're getting a lot of those powdery, ambery, floral aspects of, of the composition. Sort of the spicy, powdery, floral composition. Um, and the animalic, musky, leathery feel to the base really feels like, I will say this though, it really feels like it stays true to that sort of gothic period, renaissance, um, you know, inspiration. What inspired the fragrance, if you will. Um, so imagine things like these uh, old style gothic cathedrals and these uh, devotional religious bits of artwork and stained glass windows and all that good stuff, right? Um, that's sort of the image that you really can get in the base as it dries down. The opening, uh, you know, you might have to grasp at straws a little bit to try to understand how they got to how, you know, how they got to, um, to Opus 1144 being the, uh, the, the inspiration, but the dry down, it does start to make sense to me. I can see this sort of, uh, inspiration in the base. Once that leathery bit dries down, and and one thing about this perfume too, and and I noticed it with, but not today as well. Whenever I smelled that one, uh, is it doesn't fall apart. These are not fragrances that fall apart in the base. They really do stay together, and that that balsamic touch of iris, which adds a little bit of class to it, uh, and then of course that vanillic benzoin sort of warmth with the the musks being amped up. That's the main thing to remember. Is that to me. The one thing that I would add to, there's only a couple videos on this on YouTube, just a couple. One is from uh, Dana from A Nose Nose, who I really respect her uh, and, and her nose. She, uh, she She's a fantastic uh, reviewer. I wish she did more work. I really trust her her nose and, and the content that she puts out. She did a video on this about a year ago. It's one minute long. And she said that it basically smells like dried spit, um, which maybe I could see that. I mean, I could see... Um, I, because of the ambergris and the, the heavy musk composition, but to me, I think that the biggest thing that I can add over what other YouTubers have said about this fragrance is the musk heavy bit of the composition. Because when I first started picking things out that I thought had a little bit of a similarity to, uh, Opus 1 1144, it was stuff like Musk Kublai Khan. I mean, they were musk heavy compositions. Claire de Musk is probably a little too sweet, a little too, um, clean, but, uh, something like, something like, uh, Carnicure or something like, um, Musk Ravageur is a perfect comparison, I think, to, um, Opus 1144 with that ambery bit mixed in, if you will, but it's the musk heavy composition that really takes the cake on this one that a lot of people I don't think were highlighting because, I get a lot, a lot of musk. They play the main, they play the star of the show in this composition to me. Not the ambers, not the vanilla. Uh, sort of this powdery muskiness, if you will. Very nice composition. Loved getting to know it. Well, am I going to go out there and buy a bottle? No. If I was going to buy anything from this brand, it would actually be that, but not today, um, fragrance. So Opus 1144 came out in 2015, by the way. The one I'm talking about that is my favorite so far is that it came out in 2018, so it's a little bit of a newer composition. And then I think Love's, the original fragrance, which I know Rich Mitch really loved, came out in 2013. That's the oldest of the bunch that we've talked about today. So definitely a house I want to look into more. I want to smell the uh, en Enui Noir from 2016. I want to smell Love's from 2013. I want to smell uh, Relikia, Relikia from 2021. Um and Skusami from 2020, and, and Symphony Passion from 2016. There's a whole host of fragrances from this house I would love to dive into a little bit more. This house is really, really interesting. The, the whole aesthetic, and actually, Filippo Sorsinelli has a YouTube channel, and they did a video for this fragrance for um, Opus 1144 whenever it came out. And, you know, it's like a minute or two long and it's basically, you know, like bubbling sounds in the background and footsteps walking and 
Uh, didn't say a word on the whole YouTube video. It was, and, and that sort of marketing reminds me a lot of Orto Parisi. If you've ever seen Orto Parisi's marketing, it's just like pictures and you form your own sort of opinions on what the scent is like. Um, but I like the inspiration. I like the fragrance. The, qu the material quality is there. The price is respectable. It's expensive, but it's respectable for what you would expect a niche fragrance nowadays these type of fragrances just are not cheap anymore it's just how it's just how the cookie crumbles at least it's not five six eight hundred dollars like some brands um you know somebody sent me some samples recently of uh uh what's that guy's name christian Lou louboutin or i always made fun of it in my texan accent and called it labouton it's labouton um but but yeah you know and, and their bottles are like eight hundred six eight hundred dollars it's in insanity and they're gaudy caps and, you know, like that's a lot of the niche stuff that's coming out nowadays. Um, they're, they're using price as like a barrier to entry. So you can find the stuff. It's just the barrier to entry is price and everything's expensive. And so $210 for 100 mil is fair. Um, expensive, but fair in my eyes and especially for what you're getting. So definitely a house I'd like to dive into more. If anyone has experience with the house of Filippo Sorsinelli, do leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you make of uh, Opus 1144. Um, this is definitely one that I really enjoyed. I'm enjoying wearing it today as my scent of the day, but uh, not my favorite from the house. That that spot is reserved for, for the fragrance, but not today. So um, anyways, thanks for watching. I hope to see your faces in the comments and uh, cheers guys. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.